how is it sexism when we have no barriers today? So we can we can Who pick what no we want to pick. Who doesn't have barriers? Women doesn't, don't have barriers. I'm, women, yeah. What, what's we have no you? barriers. You can do whatever you want. Uh, I can you? or you can. What's stopping you? So wouldn't that explain why though, I, you're paid less? Yeah. <laughs> because I really don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to do the dangerous, dirty jobs. I know. I don't want to break a nail. <laughs> What is up YouTube? I am Alex Styles. Today I'm going to be looking at a debate between a panel of women who are either pro or anti-feminism, who will be debating feminism itself, trans rights movements, abortion and the Me Too movement. The debate that we're going to watch was first published on the YouTube channel Vice, who have for some reason decided that comments should be turned off. So as we can imagine it was quite a heated debate. Let's get into it. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Liz Landers, I'm Vice News' chief political correspondent, and we are here today to talk about some of the biggest issues dividing women across the country. In other words, we're here to talk about feminism. In today's polarized world, is feminism dead? Yeah, I saw your hand. I think that depends on the definition of feminism. <laughs> I strongly think that feminism is more of an action than an identity. I would say it's uplifting all women, in which case it's very alive. At the same time, um, if we do follow that definition, feminism has splintered off into so many different areas that you can look at um, people like Sheryl Sandberg who say you should just get another nanny if you feel oppressed. And if we're talking <laughs> about that kind of feminism, um, yeah, it's pretty dead. Yeah, I mean, as long as the human race exists, feminism, feminism will never be dead. There's something that we're always going to have to strive and work, work towards um, to make sure that there's equality. So feminism is not dead. Okay, so immediately she foresees that there is always going to be this struggle for equality. And I'm not saying she's completely wrong, just that we know that by the way she sees the world and she sees the future of the movement of feminism, it's going to be an everlasting struggle. And so feminism must always exist. And in some sense that is correct in that there always needs to be equalizing forces on both sides. That's if you don't view yourself as equal with men. So you see there is a lot of assumptions as well as implications for the way in which we think. Whereas if we were to simply look at the world a little bit differently, we would perhaps begin to accept a lot of the progress that has been made so that we don't always have to view it as like a struggle or an uphill battle just because we perhaps would like to identify more as victims. And I'm honestly not trying to victim blame here. It is just one extra parameter that does come into play. I don't know that it can die. As long as there's power and oppression, there will be people fighting for equity. And um, until that somehow goes away, feminism is alive and well. This is of course a valid point, as well as a very interesting one. We of course come across this in Friedrich Nietzsche's work on the idea that morality was born out of movements which originated within oppressed people, so essentially poor people being oppressed by wealthy people who were in power, based on the reality of course that usually the people in power do tend to abuse that power in one way or another, either consciously or unconsciously. Nietzsche, of course, criticized the traditional morality, which he believed was based on the suppression of the natural instincts of human beings. He argued that morality was a product of human culture and that it evolved over time to serve the interests of those in power. He essentially believed that traditional morality was a form of self-denial which prevented individuals from reaching their full potential. He also argued that there was a distinction between master morality and slave morality. The former being the morality of the powerful and the latter being the morality of the weak and oppressed. He believed that the morality of the strong was based on a will towards power, while arguing that the morality of the weak was based on a desire to get revenge against the strong. Ultimately, Nietzsche believed that individuals should create their own values and morality, rather than simply accepting the values and morality imposed upon them by society. He argued that individuals should embrace their natural instincts and desires and use them to achieve their goals and become the best versions of themselves. Just a little side note there, let's continue. I think feminism um, isn't actually about equality, it's about equality when it benefits us. <laughs> I think feminism 
It's really about women wanting special privileges and treatment at the expense of men often. And I think it's alive and well, sadly. Okay, so this panelist is of course Pro from the YouTube channel Just Pearly Things, who is best known for, in my eyes, promoting the red pill ideology, which is of course an analogy from the movie The Matrix, where Neo essentially has to make a choice between taking the blue pill or the red pill. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? You could say that. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. choice essentially being that whichever of the pills you take will give you a sense of which reality you are in. If you take the blue pill, you will remain in this dreamlike reality that you think you live in. It's an analogy that describes the completely different perceptions of the objective world, which define the different opinions that we have and the different beliefs that we have about how we see the world around us. She is, of course, admittedly an anti-feminist who recognizes correctly, in my view, that at least in the Western world, feminism has definitely gone too far. In many ways, the most obvious way being the fact that it has led to an unjustified general hate towards all men. It's no longer about the empowerment of women, but rather than continuing to view the world as oppressed by man, whereas the actual reality, the red pill, is simply that we've now taken feminism to its extreme which was always going to happen, mind you, given what I believe to be the fact that we are in the infancy of our species. The masses simply can't keep up with what is going on. But of course, I do have quite a few criticisms of Pearl's approach, which is that she makes the same mistake as feminism as just taking one side only. She, of course, bases a lot of what she says on statistics and believes that women, for example, should become more traditional. In other words, go back to more traditional values rather than accepting the reality that feminism has done a lot of good, that perhaps it was always meant to be this way and that women were supposed to evolve from the traditional housewife to the extreme of the boss bitch. In other words, the women tried to wear the pants for a while. Women tried to make themselves like men and in many ways succeeded. Some women really liked that. And you know what? There's a lot of men that really like that. I, for example, prefer a partner rather than a supporter or servant. While there is, of course, something to be said about taming the boss bit. Not that that is always healthy, mind you. You don't say. And so in that way, enacting the traditional roles between men and women, I believe that people can change and that the dynamics can change within a relationship throughout time. And ultimately it's about whether it works for you or not. 
In any case, the point that I'm making is that feminism has actually spurred on this evolution of women and subsequently the evolution of men into a psychologically and spiritually different form of humanity. Some people still remain traditional, while other people are heading in a different direction. And that, for some reason, scares the traditional people. There is, in actual fact, so many things that you can unpack about all this that I could talk for hours on this subject, but we need to continue with the video. I think feminism is also alive and well. Um... There are different kinds of feminism, right? Like, that is obvious. Um, and I, for me, as, as a womanist, as a black feminist, right, as someone who's really thinking about human rights, dignity, right, equity, right, as long as that's not, that need isn't met, we're still gonna keep fighting. I'd say it's alive and well. I'd say that it's also very nuanced, and I think what it looks like is gonna differ depending on where you are in the world. For me, I just see it as, a lens, which isn't necessarily antagonistic or uh, protagonistic. It's just a useful tool. I think she is definitely ignoring the fact that it has become antagonistic and protagonistic. Because one of the unfortunate circumstances of the way that we live in the modern day is that we tend to identify too much with one thing or just a few things. And oftentimes people make that one or two things their entire career. And so you can understand that once a feminist has made a career out of being feminist, then suddenly if feminism were to stop being relevant, then that means the end of her career if she's not willing to adapt. And most often the case is that they're not willing to adapt. I'm sure some of them will adapt their game as they increasingly become more irrelevant. Because as we're going to see later on in this discussion, there are various other subjects which have been incorporated into feminism in order to keep the movement relevant. And these things don't have anything to do with feminism. Irrelevant testimony, entirely irrelevant. Similar to what Pearl just said, I find that a lot of feminist ideology and thought today feels more of like a supremacist movement rather than something that is supposed to be advancing the goals of equality. I don't think that we can really term what's going on as feminism because it looks so different to, I think, the earlier feminist movements. So in that way, I would say it's taken its last breaths of life. It's dying. Essentially, that's the point that I just made. <laughs> Sensational. Yeah, I definitely think um, it's getting more and more radicalized, for sure. So it's it's definitely still alive. So great, that's the same argument, but this time used to argue that feminism is still alive. As we're going to see, though, throughout this debate, a lot of the subjects that are now included in sort of, quote, feminist debates are actually problems faced by people in general, not just women. I think I'll preface and say that I don't know so much about modern Western feminism, and there might be a lot of terms that I don't know, like political jargon and stuff. But I believe in the advancement of women, whoever considers themselves a woman. Uh, I think there's a deficiency in society. So it's deeply rooted that um, feminism has always existed. I think America's a little obsessed with themselves and it's like always feminism is rooted in America <laughs> and like, oh, white women started it. And it's kind of offensive because for thousands of years, women have been dying for their rights. It's not entirely obvious to me which problems women specifically are facing in Western society today in comparison to men, though I'm sure that there are, of course, some remaining issues. Like, I don't want to say that the entire movement is completely dead, although in order to be in a position to judge, we would need to look at the subjects and talk about them, of course. If they do arise in the debate, I'll mention them again. If not, then I will try to get into it in future videos. I think as a black woman specifically, uh, when you talk about feminism, yeah, the mainstream first thing you think about is a certain type of feminism that tends to exclude still, even today, even with intersectional fem feminism, exclude um, African-American women. And it's always kind of done that. And also upper middle class white women has predominantly been the face of what we quote unquote consider feminism. I think feminism is attempting to say, okay, the first thing we agree on is that there are barriers and friction to what I need and what I want based on the fact that I'm a woman. What it ignores is that, and what privilege is, is that you may not have to think that being a woman and being a black woman and being a black woman who has a disability, for example, impacts you further. You have more barriers, you have more friction, you are less able to get what you want. You're undervalued in a way that's like, okay, well, you know, that's life. That's what I mean by equity and that we're able to, without friction, all get the same needs met. 
I'm not sure what she means by without friction, I'll get the same needs met. Yeah, see, I disagree with that. I think life is easier if you're a girl, um, actually. Yeah, I, think, I think there's a lot of benefits um, that men don't have. I'm, I'm not going to speak anything to race. I'm just talking about gender specifically. It's usually like an excuse. Like, honestly, I think as a girl, you have equal opportunity in the world. I think there's benefits. Like, for example, we have quotas for women in specific jobs that are given to us that aren't given to men. So, yeah, I would, I would say it's easier being a girl. That's Just from a viewpoint over here, though, <sighs> it seems there's a lot of privilege, pretty privilege in what you're saying and mm -hmm. that you're white and you present. Do you think I'm pretty? Thank you. I think that you present in a way that beauty standards have accepted. And so they call me ugly on the internet all the time. They, they be roasting me daily, I swear to God. I don't mean to say I think you're gorge. I just mean that there are a certain value that we give to certain bodies. To I mean, let's that. also dig into mm -hmm. why these quotas exist and why these, um, what you're calling because privileges Because we want exist. special treatment. Um, no, but it's because there have historically and presently in most jobs been fewer women. Mm -hmm. And because of sexism. How is it sexism when we have no barriers today? So we can we who can pick who no we want to pick. Doesn't have barriers. Women doesn't don't have barriers. I'm, women, yeah. What, what's we stopping have no you? Barriers. You can do whatever you want. Uh, I can you? or you can. What's stopping you? What did he say? Hey. Oh. As a woman, as a woman. As a woman. As a woman, See, as a woman. That ignores a lot that I'm a woman with a disability. So mm -hmm. there's a lot stopping me that you mm -hmm. don't have to think about. Well, okay, but in that case, the disability is, of course, something that a man could face as well. Any person could face. It's not gender specific. So this is one of the examples that doesn't necessarily need to be included in feminism. It's not because you're a disabled woman that you have barriers. It's that you are a disabled person which is a complete tragedy, but has nothing to do with your gender. As I said before, I'm about. speaking about women. I'm not, you're speaking I'm not, as, a, you're speaking for yourself. You're speaking as, a, as an able-bodied able -bodied like, woman. woman. I, I that is white. presents of course, white. Of you're speaking as an able, <laughs> as an able woman. Okay, what about, yeah, it's like, it's like the panelists that disagree here are saying, yeah, but you are not only privileged, you are speaking as an able, a fully able functional woman. And I ask you again, what does that have to do with gender? You get what I'm saying. Of course, there's going to be other barriers if you're disabled. I'm sure. Well, like I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm talking about as a woman. So you're just going to ignore white the women pay have it gap. easier. Yes, I would agree. What? Is, you're, you're just going to ignore the pay gap. Um. There's no pay gap. It's been debunked by many people, notably Jordan Peterson. I'll try and find the link somewhere and link it in the description. But also from this kid right here. Uh, the definition of feminism is equality between men and women, if you look it up on Google. In this presentation, I'm going to prove to you that that, in 2016, is not the case. There was a first wave of feminism, the suffragettes who campaigned for the vote and for equality, and then there was second wave feminism in around the 60s, campaigned for equality in, sort of, in domestic gender roles and things like that. So, and then recently there's been a third wave, third wave feminism, who have consistently lied about things. For example, the wage gap between men and women. That is a lie. 77 cents to the dollar is a lie. It doesn't take into account the different hours worked by men and women on average in jobs. It doesn't take into account the different jobs that men and women do. And it doesn't take into account a many, many other factors. Once you factor all these in, it is statistically irrelevant that the wage gap. This is just one example of the lies that have been <laughs> perpetrated by modern third wave feminism. It's not about equality. It's not. It's about lying. Thank you very much. Any questions? Would you consider yourself a feminist? <laughs> <laughs> no, Harry, I would not because I don't believe, well, I believe in equality, but I don't believe in feminism because I believe that that's not about equality. Any more questions? So, originally, feminism was created because there was an imbalance. Yeah. And originally, it was the, the imbalance between men and women. The idea now is not feminism being an imbalance of gender, but being equality of all. Um, you, talk a lot about men versus women. But what about people who call themselves transgender? What about people that perhaps don't identify with a gender at all? In relation to what? How they should be perceived by society. Do they not count in the idea of fem feminism? 
Well, no, because feminism, if you look up the definition, which if you ask a feminist, they'll always refer you to, is about the, the push for women's rights and equality between men and women. If I call myself a feminist, I wouldn't say that I battle for the rights of women. I would say I battle for the rights of equality. So <coughs> when we talk about the shift of language... That doesn't make sense. The word feminism literally means a movement for women's rights, not for all people's rights. The shift of language and definitions. Is it not fair to say that definitions shift and change depending on the needs within society? <laughs> Isn't it fair to say that definitions can shift or change depending on the needs in society? No, that is not at all fair to say. You can't just pick and choose what suits you because it's convenient. Stop it. Get some help. Well, just because you say you are something doesn't mean that that's what the movement is about. So I could say that I'm a, a radical jihadist doesn't mean that I'm a radical <laughs> jihadist. <laughs> well, because you can say that you're something, but the movement doesn't necessarily represent that. If you're, if you say that, because if you say that you're about equality for all, say what you mean and mean what you say. If, you're, if you say that, because if you say that you're about equality for all, then most of them is <laughs> about equality for all. It's about equality between um, men and women. That's what modern feminism is about. For example, with the wage gap, they haven't. When they give you the wage gap statistics, seventy-seven cents to the dollar, they don't mention other people who may not identify with the gender or people who identify themselves as trans. So that's the main thing that I'm fighting. This sounds like the teacher actually asking these questions, which is interesting to think about where the problem starts. It also goes to show how teachers are human beings as well and they are just as unconscious of objective fact because of personal biases. So yeah, I'd say that there is equally a disparity between class systems. There is, so if you are born into a certain class of family, your income equates to a certain amount and that's purely with how you're born, which is a very similar thing to do with gender. Do you think that that is as much of an issue if not more so, or less so, than gender inequality. But that is an entirely different subject which has nothing to do with gender. Fair enough though, she's asking the question in a way which seems to have accepted what he said so far, but now she wants to see what he thinks about equality in general. Anyway, it's a weird line of questioning. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about gender inequality and how it's misrepresented by feminism because they're saying that they're for gender <laughs> equality when they're actually not. Okay, so what are your thoughts on inequality in general, including the class system? Well, ideally, I would like to eradicate all inequalities, but you, I'm not going to do that by calling myself a feminist. <laughs> I can also cite anecdotal incidences from my own knowledge of male lawyers working for 400 euros a month in contrast to a female secretary that was working at the same law firm and making a thousand euros a month purely because she had been there for a longer time period. What did he say? So not only was there a disparity between the wages of different occupations in those instances, but there was also a male to female disparity, which was justified because of time served in employment. So you see in the private sector, gender has no bearing on wages. It's equally true that an employee, could be a man or a woman, may value themselves higher than what they're getting paid at the time of their employment and therefore seek to find a job somewhere else. That somewhere else then pays more than their previous employment. And so they go to their boss and tell them this is the situation. This other firm is offering me 3000 euros per month and I'm currently getting 2000 euros per month. In this case, the current employer will need to either match what the other firm is willing to pay. And if they do that, would it be fair that they also have to raise the salaries of all the rest of the employees? In the private sector, it's all about competition. That's how the employment sector works. Both a man as well as a woman could find themselves in that position. And so gender is completely irrelevant. And yet the mainstream leftist narrative all these years has been that there is a pay gap. 
which is an outright lie. You're, you're just going to ignore the pay gap, um, regulation over bodies. The pay gap has been well, proven and, and debunked pay gap endlessly, doesn't exist. my friend. Oh my it God, doesn't, it's, so it's, funny. The, it's the industries that women pick. There, uh, let's talk about it. There's a pay gap, but it's because women don't want to do the hardest industries. Would you rather have a high-profile job for no pay or clean sewers for $100,000 a year? I think a high-profile job. <laughs> Come on, ladies, y'all not listening. He specifically said without pay. With no pay. With no pay. With no pay. I would prefer to have the high profile job without pay because if I was high profile, I'd market myself to be sponsored by some company. Okay, you're not getting paid, but you would be sponsored by a company. If you're not famous, the sponsor is not going to give you a lot of money. Sponsored by some company. I'm cleaning sewers for a hundred K, man. Ain't no shame in my game. See? No shame in his game. You know why? We are built like that. I'm cleaning sewers. There's no question about it. Clean sewers for a hundred thousand dollars a year. I'd rather to first work. <laughs> These women are not getting it. You're working for free. You're not getting any money. So wouldn't that explain why the, you're paid less? Yeah. <laughs> because I really don't want to do that. <laughs> you don't want to do the dangerous, dirty jobs. No. I don't want to break a nail. Ah, you cursed brat! Look what you've done! I'm melting! Melting! Oh, what a world! What a world! So could that possibly be why so many women earn less money than men? Yep. <laughs> So is that based on discrimination or based on choice? And choices. <laughs> you can't make this shit up. You can't make this shit up. Y'all heard it. I don't think it's that simple. I think like I think that's a, an oversimplification. I think the fact of the matter is that women structure their lives differently to men. Men don't give birth. Men don't have have to carry pregnancies. Men don't have to be the primary caregiver most of the time. Women also don't hold jobs for as long as men do. They often will stop and start. They'll go back into work. They'll take time off. They'll take part-time jobs. The way that men work and women work are astronomically different. And to try to say that they're comparable is, is where this issue comes from. They're not comparable. Two things. First of all, um, let's dig into why they think that um, they should take these jobs, which is society, societal sexism. And then also, um, actually, all I mean, Department of Labor, all statistics, at least speaking in the U.S., um, have found that when compared for the same jobs, there still is a pay gap, particularly when it pertains to race. Because 60 percent of women have never asked for a raise. So how can you complain about your pay if why, you don't why ask? Are they, because, why are they not asking? Wait, what happens when women ask for a raise? So, Sorry, I just, sure. I've, been, yes. I've been wanting to say something, but I want to be respectful. Of, I don't, like, don't want to interrupt Do people, it. and I want to let them finish their just thoughts. jump in. Just but, you know, go through it's the just, wall. Uh, it is a very privileged label, right, to be able to say that you're feminist, right? Right, and I say that because I come from a working class background of Dominican immigrant parents. My mother would not necessarily identify as a feminist. I look to my mother and I do think of her as a feminist. A lot of my ideas and my empowerment comes from seeing her like survive and put food on the table. When I'm thinking about feminism, I'm always thinking about who's not part of the conversation. What are the barriers? How do we think about equity? How do we think about self-empowerment and agency and having a voice, right? And having choice mm -hmm. and thinking about our basic human rights, education, access to health, uh, homes, like having bread, having food. And those things are very important, right? And they're at the crux, right? About of what a lot of us here know that we need. It's like there are the barriers, right, that we constantly ignore that are very much systemic and microaggressive, right? We see them and experience them every like day. What? But they're not specific to women. These are specific to poor people and or other minorities. Uh, in the US, so, like what? What would you like to know an example of? I, I know you said, you said that there's like barriers. I wanna know what barriers in the US today as a woman. Well, as a woman or as a woman of color, let's be specific. As a woman, I said and we as don't, a woman. Well, no, I can't answer as a woman. I just, just feel like your woman, question is right? kind of hostile when you're like, I don't, I, there are no barriers to what I want. Congratulations. That means you have a privilege where you're not facing any friction and that's I mean, showing. And I feel like it's I think like as an ignoring. Amer I think as an American, you're very privileged. Oh, like, I mean, I'm not ignoring that. Yeah, right, or like a so. basic level of what, I mean, the feminist movement is when it comes to just being born a woman, right? Physically, pound for pound, we are born as women and we have less lean muscle mass than men. So there are, 
issues of violence and assault and stuff like that. And so therefore, there are policies, there are things to help women physically, like, for example, I believe being able to carry a firearm and being able to use that safely to defend yourself against men who are born naturally with more muscle mass than a woman. But most victims of violent crime are men. And so again, that's an issue that there is with violent crime. And if you're going to raise the gun argument and the protection argument, it's not just women that need protection. Everybody needs protection. Men might be more able to physically defend themselves against a violent crime. So I'm not really understanding what she would want, like to allow gun carrying for women, but not for men. How does that work exactly? And even when you use the argument. It does happen that men get raped by women too. It's not as common, but it does happen. And so why are we making this an only woman issue rather than a general safety issue of the population against violent crime? I keep hearing the term equity. What would in a world that, that has equity look like? Like, would it be would it be 50 percent of everyone in the same jobs? Would it be like prison? 50 percent? That's equality. 50 percent. So, yeah. so, so what does equity look like? So equity is generally described as a state of fairness because historically a lot of people have been arguing for equality. But mm. what does that give us? Um, like uh, like 0.5 of the one percent being woman. This doesn't really do anything for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Why does that not do anything for them? I mean, if the one percent, I mean, if the one percent of the ruling elite are men, then if women were to constitute half of that percentage, that would get you somewhere. I'm not sure if things would be much different than they are today, unless I'm not understanding her argument for some reason. So people have talked about equity instead, which is um, instead of sameness, it's fairness. Mm -hmm. And this would mean that we remove systemic barriers mm -hmm. to um, to engage in society, not just for women, but also for so, everyone. So but, but then you would have to define what those barriers are, which I haven't seen any barriers defined which are gender specific at this point. Which barriers? Yeah. Okay, those barriers so, that you don't believe in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what I don't, it do I don't, for you to have a bunch of ramps in your life? Oh, that's, oh, that's such a lame answer. Which barriers? The ones that you don't believe in. Well, which are they? The ones that you don't believe in. Do you see the fallacy? And I'm glad that Pearl is there pushing them to identify what it is, what exactly are the barriers that women face today, specific to their gender. Okay, Those barriers so, that you don't believe in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what I don't. It I do, do for you to have a bunch of ramps in your life. It doesn't do sh I need those ramps, right? Can we stick to male versus female? That's, that's my question. So I, I'm thinking male versus female. But my so feminism what, includes but so, but so, ability, it so, includes but my race. my question is You guys women. Can, can talk. Women can versus talk. men. I guess somebody might be asking her to moderate here a little bit, but she's saying, okay, you can keep going. Like what, what barriers do we need removed? Because that, that's my statement. I'm not, I'm not stating anything else. I'm stating women versus men. It's very silly. Like, so, it's so what barrier? Why is I just silly? The question it's a is fair silly. question. So, yes. yeah, but I, I'm it's saying, not a fair question. It's how is it not a fair question? I'm proving the point of why what people, especially black women, other people who are anybody who's not white, why we hear feminism and we don't want that label because it means, I'm just going to say it means that. Like it means that you're, you've already gone to a pinnacle of whatever you think your happiness needs or whatever your survivalist needs are when there are people on lower end who are trying to survive, who are trying to get to a point of what should be normal um, based on what other people have. Sort of but why don't they just make it a people issue? Why does it have to be a gender issue? Could it be because one of the unfortunate side effects of the movement of feminism that now every woman who has any sort of problem can put that under the umbrella of feminism because it works? Not even to mention how selfish is it for you as a woman, and I mean any woman out there, to be complaining that there's people out there who are struggling in life, who have different disadvantages, different minorities or whatever, disabled people. Let's put single mothers in that category as well, even though most of the time it's their choice to be single and to not think to include in your movement other people in society who might be equally affected in negative ways by the status quo. So you choose to automatically place that under the umbrella of feminism, thereby excluding men who could be equally in struggling positions. The statistics on suicide is of course that it's men that commit the most suicides, but they don't have a movement like manism or something for the promotion of those men's rights. And the reason is precisely because we don't identify as victims of gender. The gender thing is done. There are pretty much no barriers in Western society for women. And so what I would describe is going on is that most of these women are seeing ghosts basically everywhere. Ghost. Ghost. Ghost town. 
Brown. Rose Brown. Because of that mentality, they're still stuck in that mentality of we're oppressed. I'm a victim of oppression. People, especially black women, other people who are anybody who's not white. That's a racism issue. Your feminism, and we don't want that label because it means, I'm just gonna say, it means that. Like, it means that you're, you've already gone to a pinnacle of whatever you think your happiness needs or whatever your survivalist needs are when there are people on lower end who are trying to survive, who are trying to get to a point of what should be normal. The wealthy and the oppressed, that's the dynamic here. We, we spoke about this in the beginning of the video. Um, based on what other people have. It sort of sounds like you're saying feminism is not always inclusive then. Right, it's most of the time it's not inclusive. Oh, so now it's not inclusive. So now it's not inclusive enough because you're labeling it wrong. It is not a women's rights issue anymore. It is it, more times than not, it's it's not. So, and it, within the just feminism space, again, they're obviously the very basic is male versus female versus, you know, but unfortunately, we've only had one subset of women be the face and voice and the academics and research and everything to be able to say, well, that's the standard we need to be in when there are other people who are still trying to get to some type of normalcy and just living. What is the biggest issue then that feminism faces? I think it's the mindset. Women taking like the agency, women taking initiative. I think it's mindset holding them back a lot because if you want to be in a competitive world and compete, you have to have the right mindset. And I think a lot of people blame their lack of confidence or what society tells them um, for the reason that they, they're not achieving what they need to achieve. When okay, on this point, I don't think it is only a mindset issue. And again, this applies to both women and men. If you haven't got the mindset that will get you to where you wanna go, you're not gonna get there no matter how much privilege you have. But of course, if you don't have equal opportunities as everyone else, then that is going to be the barrier, which basically keeps some people ahead of others. It's basically the unequal distribution of resources in the world. Has nothing to do with gender though. Achieving what they need to achieve. When that's not the case, you have to have the mindset of achieving because the men who built the world had the mindset of building it. So the women who want to engage and build that further, they need to have that same mindset. I don't think we do. I don't, I think it's like assuming that we all want to be capitalist babies. Right. I think that men are not well adjusted in the society <laughs> and no, women are not trying to re-embody what they have built for us. Mm. I think it's a bit of a leap from her to say that men are not well adjusted in the society where basically they've built all the world that we see around us. Of course, if women wanted to compete in that world, and I'm sure some women are already doing it, then they would have to have the same mindset as the men. Not thinking of it through the lens of you have to do this or whatever, but because it's the most effective strategies that we know right now, is that specific mindsets lead to particular outcomes. That, and that's where a lot of modern women disagree about the roles that men and women have to have. I'm referring, of course, to the traditional roles of man and woman. Some women don't want to assume the role of the man, whereas others are pretty happy to do so. Some of them, of course, are doing it for the wrong reasons because of psychological oppression. They think like, oh, we have to become like men. Whereas others are like, well, do you know what? Like, do you know what? I like kind of being a woman or what being a woman means. But like, I don't see the oppression here. I think that like what we're forgetting is a very important detail, which is just like human respect and dignity. Yeah. That's and true. not asking people to prove what their experience is and to prove to you like it is like such conservative thinking to say like, I don't understand, explain it to me, versus just saying, I don't understand and let me respect what you are no, saying. I, I, would, I would say that the, I don't understand, please explain it to me is equally as bad as the, do you know what? I wanna be this way and you have to respect that. Because the only way that that conflict comes into fruition is when one person is asking, you know what? I want to be treated this way. And that of course alludes to the platinum rule, which is a relatively new development from the golden rule that we've always known throughout history. So the golden rule is treat others as you wanna be treated. Whereas the platinum rule is 
treat others the way they want to be treated. And that is perfectly fine, just as long as the way you want to be treated is benign for society. And whether or not something is benign towards society is something that should be discussed and based on values that we can all agree on. But the only way that that discussion can take place is if each side is interested to know what the other side's arguments are, what the other side's wants, needs, and essentially what their arguments are for those wants and needs. But this, of course, would be too much of a general conversation because we're not talking about specific cases right here. But in order to have any specific cases of like something that you are asking of, let's say, some privilege or right that you are asking for, then of course that needs to be justified in some objective way. But in this case, we don't have the luxury of having a case in point to discuss. We basically have to be content in talking in generalities at this point. Well, I'm respecting right? wherever you're starting point. I'm respecting that. I'm really respecting that. I'm saying that if you don't have the mindset, you can even achieve it. You're never going to even try. So it's but never achieve what? Like what are we talking about? Because I feel like you projected world. this like no, capitalist achieve... ideology she on every woman. She's right about the projecting of the capitalist ideology on every on every woman. But it's not only on every woman; it's on every man as well. It's like it's like we need to keep saying this. Look, most people are not born with the capitalism mindset. They're born historically. It's only been the very few people who have gone into entrepreneurship, and it's those people that have ended up with the most power because entrepreneurship is of course the best way to accumulate wealth as opposed to the nine to five. And so it's perfectly obvious that most people don't want to go down the entrepreneur route because at least up until now, somebody's got to serve burgers at McDonald's. That is of course going to change drastically in the future, but we're not there yet. Most people don't want the entrepreneur mindset. That goes for women and men. Again, it's not gender specific. That's why most men who listen to these motivation videos, they need these motivation videos to motivate them to get into entrepreneurship, which is a bit of a grind. Let's do it tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow because that ideology has been projected onto our society in general, mostly on men. And so what this girl on the left here is saying is that if you want to match the outcome of what the men have been able to build so far in the world, then you need to match that mindset. And they're basically disagreeing on stuff that doesn't even have to do anything with feminism, because it's not just women that don't want to be put into that mindset of the entrepreneur. It's also a lot of men that don't want to. People in general are just happy to work their nine to five. They want to do other things. They, want, they don't want their entire life to be work. Car wash. Ha <laughs> Guys, uh, not to be a naysayer or anything, but the only customer we've had is that weird guy who keeps paying Justin to wash his truck. That's it, boy. Get in there nice and deep like. Yeah, that's not good. Achieve whatever it is you're looking for, equality, equity. But what I'm saying is women in the feminist space and a lot of these other spaces, we don't acknowledge that we have to take the initiative. We have to take the action. We have to have the mindset. We have to demand those things. I don't understand how we're getting so off topic. This is about feminism, feminism today. Whereas everybody wants to make this about their individual, oh, I, here are all the, the multitude of other things that factor into my person. Great, this is about feminism. It's about womanhood. I understand that all of you have your own individual experiences and, and the other things that feed into you as a person, that's perfectly fine. But this is where intersectionality falls off the planet and loses, I would argue, probably the vast majority of people, including me. I'm not even a feminist. I don't give a crap about feminists arguing amongst themselves about who's the most victimized. But this is annoying to listen to. I honestly just, I don't understand anything anybody's even trying to get at. It's very annoying to listen to. Yeah, she, she gets it. I like that they show the reactions of people here. 
Like Pro obviously here is agreeing. Look, I just want to say that I don't think equity and this concept of competition can't coexist with each other. Equity is building more facilities for people who need them. It is recognizing that there are holes in the market and there's opportunities for women and feminine expansive people and meeting those opportunities. See, I, I think equity can can buoy the, the pre-existing system that we live in in a good way. And this is where we're going to get to um, what I think the real feminist arguments are are based off of policy. And abortion is the biggest one. Okay, we're done with feminism. We're getting into abortion now. Let's go. How many of you would identify as pro-choice? Let's do a show of hands for pro-choice. I feel like pro-choice is pro-life though. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and folks who identify as pro-life, why do you identify as each? You've gone from legal, safe, rare, to, yeah, I'm so proud, let me beatbox in front of the Planned Parenthood. Yeah, I got murder on my mind. I, the fact that, that it's celebrated that, that murdering uh, children, especially uh, in late-term pregnancies, is celebrated that people are so proud of themselves from mutilating a fetus is just, it, it, it blows my mind. And I don't think that you need yeah. to be pro-life to even take that stand. And you said late-term pregnancy. Okay, but you can't base your argument for why you are pro-life or pro-choice on the fact that some idiotic people are deciding to celebrate or supposedly celebrate the idea of killing babies, which that's not what they are actually celebrating. They are celebrating the fact that they have access to a medical procedure that their life could depend on. They're not celebrating the kill of a fetus or a baby. You said late-term pregnancy. Yes. A lot of abortions do not happen I made the distinction. Oh, I made the distinction right. specifically they, because right. lots of people still celebrate. There are people who, when the laws were passed actually here in right. New York, they, they said, yes, great, yes, I love the right, fact but that... you need to ask about what are people celebrating, right? They're celebrating access. Well, we're not well, celebrating okay. killing kids. Like, that's, that's but not what it why, is. Well, well see, so this is right? what I'm saying. So, like, when, here's the thing. When we're talking about access to reproductive health and to abortion rights, right, and to being pro choice listen that's your body you do you no. the child if is you not decide... your body as i go <laughs> yeah your body your choice for me like the most fundamental rights are individual rights and i've still not heard any succinct moral arguments on why the life of a fetus is more important than an already living human being which could in fact be risking their life in order to bring into this world another life listen that's your body you do you no. the child if is you not decide... your body the child is not your body. Yes, the child is not your body. So she's arguing for the separate life of the child. And I would say here, what is it that would make anybody else want to have a say in the affairs of another person on whether one person reproduces or not? What do you care? What do you care about anybody else's affairs? Are you the one paying their bills? Are you the one going to support that baby? Would you rather that baby be born and then be put, and then be put up for adoption? What is the point of that? What and what is it that makes you what is it that makes pro-lifers think that they have any say over the lives of other people when that clearly does not affect their life in any way? I really don't get it. And what's the moral argument for it? Do you think God is going to punish society because some members of society decide to have abortions. I really can't fathom what the moralistic argument is for pro-lifers. What it seems to be is that they're simply indoctrinated or brainwashed by some wrong ideas or some abstract moral ideas that they don't even know where they got from. Basically, they just want to stick their noses in other people's business because the idea is abhorrent and it is abhorrent to everyone. However, there are times when abortions are necessary and could be for the greater good. In fact, philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer, being a nihilist, would argue that it would be a tragedy to bring a life into this world anyway because he saw the whole world from a nihilistic perspective, which of course I believe is completely wrong. But at the same time, we've also got to acknowledge that abortion exists in nature as well. I spoke about this in in another video actually in, in which I included a link to an article which shows the different forms that nature has of aborting fetuses. Sometimes the offspring are eaten by the mother. This along with other forms of abortion that exists in nature. I will include that article in the description of this video. A baby. It's so scary for me to hear people calling like guns the biggest equalizer for women but taking their choices away from them at a policy level. Um, Why is that? Having a gun is an equalizer. It is. Having rights is an equalizer. Yeah, that's Having right. Having choice is right. an equalizer. Just like a gun right. And in this country, the birth policies control. that are pushed 41. to continue <laughs> perpetuating patriarchy <laughs> and anti-women, um, like taking the autonomy away from women, 
it is heartbreaking to see women pushing that propaganda. No, I, it's all brainwash. Like you, oh, it it's is, brainwash because you don't think, agree with no, me. No, I, so because I've been brainwashed. brainwashed. I have lived deeply institutionalized. Man, I, I have lived under I, Islam. Yeah. I'm not interested in any of that. Like, there's no like guilt you know, for me. Human. No, I'm not interested in like living thinking that like women are doing this really bad thing like in my religion abortion is actually allowed if the woman needs it she's allowed because you know it, it's very interesting how like fundamental america is like this fundamentalist is not, this is nothing to very, do very very like even deep, religion this is very conservative basic thinking. scientific yeah. human rights we're also talking about people not having access to abortion clinics where they're doing the things themselves and they die. No. Right? We're also talking about women in the hospital who are pregnant, who have chosen to stay with their pregnancy and have issues at hospitals and hospitals that are like, oh no, we don't do that. Listen, for whatever reason, you don't need to explain it to anybody, but a lot of times when we're talking about access to reproductive health, for me, I'm thinking about black indigenous people of color, particularly women and girls who are working class, who do not have even access to like proper sexual education. It's the oppressive state of saying, I will force you to have a child even against your own will, right? Especially when you're thinking about women and girls who, who would be forced to have these children who are already living in very traumatized and scare and scare situations. You wanna ask about barriers? That's a barrier right there. Yes. Oh, that is a legit barrier. Finally, we've found one. And this is one of my criticisms of Pearl, which I spoke about earlier. One of the legit issues that feminism still has going for it is that of the right to access to abortion, reproductive rights. It would be remiss of me, of course, not to mention the fact that men here don't have any reproductive rights whatsoever. And that, of course, is partly the only way it can be because it is the woman that carries the child, is the woman that carries the risk of the pregnancy. And so it should be her choice. The fact that a government pressured by a mob of pro-lifers, how they can force someone to take on the risk of a pregnancy, that is oppression. And Pearl here is actually pro-life, though I'm not sure on what rational thinking she bases that argument on. It's one of her own blind spots, I would say. Women in poverty aren't able to access the way that rich women are, and no matter what happens, rich women are gonna keep getting abortions, and people in poverty are gonna not. And the choice, opening it up, the overruling, is marginally affecting people of color, people in poverty, way more than people who are going to get access to those abortions. Actually, anyway. incorrect. You're mis the misquote. There's actually more abortions for people in poverty. It's just a, at a lower rate. Why do you think that abortion has been so tied up in this feminism conversation? It's all just social structure set up around bodies. So if... Not all women are able to have babies, but it's about the barriers and value that we give to these specific bodies, right? And so if abortion happens in a woman's body, that's why this conversation is coming up. Can I ask you a question? Sure. You said um, that not all women are able to have babies or pregnancies. Are you saying, meaning like an infertility issue? A number of say. reasons. There's right. all kinds of reasons that not all women are having babies. Pearl, I saw your hand up. Yeah. Um, I think women want to sleep around and not have any consequence for it. Hell yeah, yeah we do. Yeah! <laughs> Yeah, instead of, you know, taking personal accountability and being on birth control, they just want to like do whatever they want. <sighs> <laughs> I, like, I like how they all go quiet after that one. It's partly true what she's saying, like a lot of women, that's what they want and uh, and good on them for admitting that. And, and this is the only leeway that I will give pro-lifers is that we can be more conscientious of what we are doing, although that's not always possible. And for someone to be conscientious, of course, it is the woman that needs to be not only conscientious, but conscious as well of the choice that she's making to, to have unprotected sex, which could of course lead to pregnancy, while she takes no steps to avoid that, like contraception, which is widely available. If contraception were to be used, then there would be less need for abortions, although that would still not make it a certainty that unwanted pregnancies wouldn't happen anyway. So that's why at the same time you need to ensure 
ensure that there is access to the procedure of an abortion if needed because sometimes contraception fails and not only that but sometimes people are ignorant and circumstances just happen to them in ways that they can't always predict and yes of course my argument is that a lot of people are stupid and that is of course a reality awakened to a world in crisis the economy was in a state of deep neglect a great dust bowl had ravaged food supplies and the number one movie in the country was called ass and that's all it was for 90 minutes it won eight oscars that year including best screenplay and that's not to be controversial that is just a reality you say this like it's I a think bad that's thing yeah it almost sounds like you said <laughs> can i also ask do you have any care to empower women or is disempowering women part of your like steez to see this as shame, insult, guilt, need to be right, okay. I, why is it empowering to sleep around? No, no, why what is I'm it saying is like, I feel like you, you do like take, like the way why you speak on women is very sort of like, ah, women just don't want to do this. Ah, women just don't have Sorry. this. Ah, yeah, women yeah, just wanted yeah, this. Maybe I should and I wonder time. why you have say. so much like hatred towards I don't, women. I don't hate Where women. Where does that root <laughs> in? It sounds like women. you do. I am a woman. Pearl is very judgmental of a lot of women, and I'm not exactly sure where that actually comes from. I would hope to get the chance to perhaps talk to her about this at some point. But even from my perspective as a man, she does actually come across sometimes as misogynistic, though I'm not sure how conscious she is of that fact. Anyway, I can't claim to know why, but that's how she sometimes comes across. And this is what this other woman is pointing out here. I, 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 I do not mean you don't have self-hate. I can be black and still be inter exactly. internalized racism. Exactly. Like, yeah, I'm her. saying specific things that you're saying, like women don't want to work, women don't want to this, mm -hmm. women want to sleep mm -hmm. around. Mm -hmm. Where did you learn these uh, belief systems from? Because, okay, they, the question was, why, why does abortion keep getting brought up? 40% of women that have had abortions have had two or more, 40%. Good for so, them. So what does that say to me? That means you're using it as a form of birth control and they don't track the 60%. What kind see, of abortion? Like, can you let me finish? They don't track the 60% to say who in the future has abortion. So to me, it's like, why are they why are they dying so hard for abortion? They wanna sleep around with no consequences, even though you have 41 forms of birth control. Who does that benefit? I don't think that benefits women. I think actually that benefits men because it means that men can have sex with you without consequence. It that still doesn't answer the previous point that I was making of the reasons why it seems like she might come across as misogynistic. I think it's is the fact that what she has been doing as a woman is pointing out to other women some things that those women may not be aware of within their own perception and conception of reality. By the way, I'm definitely not saying that she is a misogynist. I'm just saying it it can come across as that. And that's what these other girls are arguing here. Who does that benefit? I don't think that benefits women. I think actually that benefits men. Actually that benefits men. Benefits men. men. We can't have that. We can't have that. Because it means that men can have sex with you without consequence. It means that you can sleep with whoever you feel like. Great. But there are consequences because women are the ones who get pregnant and carry babies and give birth. It's very these are, binary these are, these are, version of yes, sex. Yes, because, because sex is binary. But, but please let me finish my point. Oh God. <laughs> It's tricking women into thinking that aborting a pregnancy, terminating pregnancy, is something to be celebrated, when in reality, for a lot of women, especially those who are doing it under duress, say that they've been raped, or that, you know, in, in, this, in this small circumstances where something really traumatic has happened to them, that's a medical decision. Or, or say that they're, they're miscarrying and then they have to, you know, have a, a, an assisted termination. That's a medical procedure. It's not a celebration of, oh, look at this. The idea, the, the sort of like moral setting of that it needs to be rare is, uh, I think the delineation between that's a medical abortion and that's like a fun abortion is really interesting because they're all medical. It's all a medical procedure. And so no matter what you're doing, going in there and getting it, like that's, n it's, it's not like, oh, you're only allowed to. It's just like, you should just be able to get a medical procedure done when it's something that you need done. We shouldn't be desensitized to taking someone's life. That should never be an empowering factor for a woman. Yes, of course we shouldn't be desensitized to the fact that, that ending the life of a fetus or a baby is an objectively horrific event. But the onus is more on women 
to be more responsible with their bodies, to take appropriate contraceptive measures in order to minimize the need for abortions. But that still does not negate the need for access to abortions. I definitely agree in that, like, there should be no absolute thing any woman should do. There should not be an absolute response to incest or rape or any of these things. Every woman should have the choice of if they want to or not want to carry that child, whether it is having fun, getting raped, incest, whatever it is. It is. I don't glorify and glamorize abortion. I think it's a very traumatic thing. I doubt that if somebody wants, has to do, like if they have to do it, they'll do it. I don't think that people are like, you know, um, doing like have six, get the seventh free and having fun with it. Yeah, nobody is celebrating abortion. This is just something that gets falsely conflated by people who wish to project that sort of behavior on the pro-choicers from the pro-lifers. Oh, you wanna celebrate? You're celebrating the killing babies and all that. You must be horrible people. Where in actual fact is the fact that the pro-lifers are completely ignorant to the complexities and the nuances of the various factors that could be at play here that may in fact give rise to the need for an abortion. Like the risks to the woman's body. And then the risk to a child being born under conditions which are not favorable. So then that causes that whole cycle to keep going of people being born in not so favorable conditions and then struggling through life. Do you see how every argument can come back to bite you in the ass? Did the Dobbs decision make anybody here uh, sort of rethink abortion, abortion access, reproductive health care? It's anti-woman, right? It's anti, it does not center people to have that voice for themselves and their own decisions, right? It is a barrier, right? It's, <laughs> giving, more, it it's giving more agency to women because it's moving it back to the state level. So locally- But why would the state have locally, the, the women, to tell me what to do? Locally, the women to choose have that power. Of if you take out the, the the viewpoint that life begins at conception, which is a, a really big defining principle for both uh, the pro-life crowd, who very, very, you know, vehemently believe that, and then obviously a lot of the pro-choice crowd do not believe that. Taking that out of the equation, you do not have just whatever kind of autonomy you want as a person, it's regardless of male or female. You can't just have free run to do whatever the hell you want. That's not how society operates. So I this is such an annoying argument. She's basically referring to the social contract that if you're going to be part of a society, then you have to abide by the rules that make sure that that society is safe. We had the biggest example of this happen in recent years with the pandemic, which caused, as we know, a big debate between people about sovereignty over your own body on whether to get jabbed or not. Now, regarding the social contract, I absolutely agree with that stance. However, the test should be of whether or not somebody's decision to do or not do something will affect somebody else in such a way that their rights need to be taken away. And so in this sense, the social contract is something that we value greatly. However, and this is the big caveat that gets ignored most of the time, that there is one single value which is above any other value. And you can think of this value as an umbrella term for everything else because everything should be a subcategory of this value. And of course, I'm talking about the value of truth. The problem, of course, with the pandemic is that only one side of the spectrum was promoted through mainstream media, whereas there was fast and clear emerging evidence even before the pandemic that there was another legitimate side to that story. And what ended up happening is that the ruling elites basically weaponized that social contract for all the reasons which have after the fact been revealed that the other side of that story was in fact just as if not more legit than the official story. But I won't get into the details of that because that's beyond the scope of this video. So at, no point, at no point do I have the right to tell anyone in this room what they should or should not do with their bodies. But it's not, what, but it's not yeah, about your body. Like that, it's, it's that's not about, me respecting I have a question it's here. Not, it's not about okay, your body, it's about the kid's body. I, I don't care what you do with it's your body. It's my body. It's, right? it's, We're it's, talking about you're talking my about, body. You're talking We're about not Jordan, I saw your hand creep up. <sighs> The Dobbs decision for me reinforced how important it is that we approach these issues from a cultural perspective because it reinforces something that I have told uh, many of my colleagues and peers in the past, which is that so long as you lack a cultural consensus, any issue, 
any issue can become a political football that can be decided by another election cycle. And so long as there is no strong consensus, uh, I would expect this to be our reality going forward. These extremely vitriolic and aggressive conversations until there's another miraculous consensus that brought about Roe v. Wade. But what it more or less reinforced for me is that we're going to have more of these difficult conversations. I want to talk about transgender issues. Moving on now to part three, transgender issues. Should trans women be included in feminist conversations? How about in women's spaces? Yes, they're women. What's the question? Pearl, trans women are women. Um, so I, I want to come at this from the um, position of an athlete. Oh, Jesus. Um, so, so I play semi-pro basketball, semi-pro volleyball. So when it comes to like athletic spaces, I don't think that trans women should be allowed into athletic spaces because I don't think it's a fair... Um, I think we, as female athletes, we work so incredibly hard for the little opportunity there is in women's sports. Would this be a like, barrier for like this, There's no barrier. There's less opportunity in some industries. That's, That's what a barrier is. There's less... <laughs> it's not... No, no, no. It's That's based on the market. Me. Okay. Hold Hold on, hold on, guys. Let's... Okay. So, again, we work very hard for the little opportunity there is in the space because we're not as entertaining as the men. Sorry, we're just not. And so it's like you're going to take the little opportunity that we're given. And the problem is, like, it, we can't compete. We can't. Like, I, I'm six foot. If I go up against a six foot guy and I play basketball with him, he's going to body me. And even what happens if, if I go even up if, against you? Even, even, hold on. Body me. Even, Yelda, Yelda, hold even, on. If, even if I have years more of training. And so it's like you're taking away the little opportunity that we're given and we all work so hard for, and you're just giving it back to biological guys. It's like, this will be the end of women's sports. It's interesting how two of the other girls jumped in here to say, oh, is that a barrier? Obviously in a sarcastic response to Pearl's earlier arguments that which are these barriers that you're talking about? Oh, here the ba now you're talking about barriers. I'll give my thoughts on trans women in sports after we hear the other opinions of the other people here. Have Eli, you tried confidence? Uh, Eli. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried confidence? It's like, okay, she has, she has, a, she has a point there. <laughs> Have you tried? Have you tried confidence? Okay, well, this might be a fool's errand, but she does actually have a small point there. I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit. Like, confidence can't make me bench what a guy benches. I don't confidence can't make you me guys six, are seven. so hostile. She's sharing her and experience And confidence can't make me six, seven. No, she's field. sharing And I'd have to go. No, she's yeah. not. She's, she's, she's a woman who's had no, an experience. Not. She's sharing her misogyny, it said. <laughs> I believe this person on the right here is a trans woman. I'm happy to refer to her as a woman, of course. <laughs> Thank you. So but she's got this preconceived idea that Pearl is just acting misogynistically here. When I did speak earlier, that does, that is how she can come across. Although a lot of times when we can be labeled as something such as a misogynist, it is because of the way we do come across, but it's mostly because we are ignorant of some other facts or, or viewpoints on the subject matter. And so everyone on this panel to different degrees is unconscious of something. And so that makes them perceive the other person through a different lens and then project and then pro project a persona onto them. In this instance, the persona of a misogynist, which like I said, could be the case, but isn't necessarily the case. You've got to view every argument on its merits, not through a particular lens. Hold on, it's one at a time. You guys are so Pearl obsessed finish. with your own experiences and your own existence. And yet when a woman is sitting here telling you, I feel as though this is unfair and this is compromising and this situation is not helping women, you guys are like, meh, meh, meh. but when you're like, I'm a black person that did this, 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 and this, then it's vi valid and, and fair and viable. Eli, I want to give you the chance to respond. Um, so this is basically a joke of a talking point. Everyone has biological advantages in sports. How, how tall are you? Uh, five eleven and a half. I'm yeah, tall. I'm, I'm five foot eight. Mm -hmm. I am a trans woman. I you would crush me. You would absolutely yeah. crush bone me. density, wrist strength, yeah. muscle density. You can't switch those. Yeah, exactly. You would crush me. But also, Eli, you would never play at the level that Pearl plays because um, you would never get there. So let me give you a few more examples here, too. So Michael Phelps produced more lactic acid in his body, which caused him to swim better than any of his competitors. This was widely celebrated and nobody contested it. Now, this is a performance enhancing hormone. 
So we all have different bodies. And now I'm not saying that trans women who aren't on hormones should participate, but there are, I mean, every major, major medical and every major sports organization agrees that trans women who have been on hormones for between one and three years, depending on the organization, have the same competitive abilities. That's, that. Did the study that you're referencing had like seven people participated. That's misinformation, not, by the way. I'm referencing several different studies. I'm a trans woman and a researcher. Is it's getting this, personal. This I don't want thing, it to though, be personal. A lot personal. of us live in this space where we're told that our sure. opinions don't count because they're not the right kind of opinions. And we're constantly shouted over and talked over regardless of what we look like because there's one group in society that basically takes precedence and it's frustrating. So yeah, of course, <laughs> it's, it's, it's frustrating because maybe, when we try to talk maybe, about it, we get I'm shouted down, this, we get so. told to be quiet, we, we get we get spooking down too as well. I don't actually know what's funny about that. Seriously. So okay, there's hostility there for plenty of women. Let's try to make this an opportunity to speak. Look, I don't know. I didn't catch that. I don't know what she's laughing about. So I'll leave it up to the viewers. Do you guys, do you guys understand why she laughed at this point? Because I'm not... Uh, because I'm not getting something. Let me know in the comments. You're literally a white woman then. from Australia. You live in a bubble and you're pissed that voices that have been silenced forever finally can be heard. That's why they have the voice, because they speak up. Okay, we're having a conversation about transgender women participating in sports and I wanted to allow more people to participate. Jordan, I wanted to hear from you. So I am not a professional athlete. It, the closest thing I have ever done to anything athletic was I used to do competitive show choir when I was younger. And um, I don't feel really qualified to make carte blanche statements about whether or not trans women should compete in every kind of sport. And I understand that that is kind of, that's a hard pill to swallow. And for me, my first inclination is to approach everything through a lens of inclusivity. But at the same time, I also can't speak accurately to every kind of sport and the different things that go into it. So I really think in these instances, the decisions are best left up to the professional governing bodies that dictate these particular sports. She does raise some valid points there, although it could also be seen as her just avoiding the issue. Fair enough, she doesn't know enough about it. And to be fair, most of us, not even I, know enough about it. Nobody knows. But I think it would be at this point fair to say that what Pearl said about the fact that women cannot compete with men in sports or anything pertaining to the arena of physicality within the reality that we live in. And so in this sense, I do fully understand the concerns of women who are currently competing in sports, basically having to compete against trans women who were biologically born as men and therefore would genetically be more gifted. Now, I'm not sure whether or not there is some hormone therapies that they do to, in order to undergo the transformation, which would perhaps alter their physicality and strength in some way. I'm absolutely ignorant as to that. But at least given what we know of like a trans woman is a person who was born as a biological man then became a woman, the assertion is that they would be stronger, faster in every sense with regards to physicality, which is of course the objective reality that we do see in the real world of sports. It's true, currently biological women cannot compete with biological men. And so in that sense, it would be the end of women's sports. But would it actually? We'll talk about that in a second. I just feel like in places, as an ally, in places where there's no understanding, we can just respect and not really, like our opinions don't fucking matter. Eli, I saw you nodding your head over there. Several times. Um, <laughs> So um, th this is more than about sports. This is about um, free, free and equal participation for transgender people in social life. And the right sees this as a socially acceptable way to begin to remove trans people from different engagements in our society. So it does just start with sports or bathrooms or locker rooms, something that they find is more acceptable. And then at this point, they started to move into education, getting trans teachers fired, banning trans books. This is a route that um, is very effective because it's seen as more acceptable. Um, but it's also overlooking a lot of major details. Like, I mean, do y'all know how many um, trans women have won national titles? Same. One too many. One. one it's, too it's many. Leah Thomas is the only one. One too many. One? If, if one woman, too many? <laughs> if, if women's sports were actually going to end in some way, um, 
I mean, that's just not happening. Wouldn't you think there would be more trans women in sports when the majority of states do allow trans women full participation? International titles, zero. No um, global titles have ever been won by a trans woman. So one trans woman has won a title and Pro argues that that is one too many. So here's why I think that this isn't necessarily the end of the story. First of all, we've got to acknowledge that, that the reason why these arguments happen in the first place is because there are various phobias. In this case, it's a transphobia, or in general, you can say that society has phobias of things that they don't know. And on the one hand, everybody is afraid of things that they don't know. That's why racism exists, because inherently our first response to something that's different from what we know is fear. And that's why we get the different terms of like homophobe or transphobe or any uh, phobias of anything that is different. Now, I'm a big believer in accepting reality. And so if we have homosexual people and transsexual people, then they, of course, are part of society. And we should, of course, accept them. There's, there's no other way you can look at that because it's all human rights at the end of the day. So the really important pillar which I believe in is that we do have to always accept the reality and accept that everybody has rights. Who is to say that trans women would not serve as the catalyst, perhaps, for women to actually evolve into what, some, what in some sense the feminist dream always was, to be as strong as men. Now that might be an anomaly, but who is to say that that's necessarily wrong? If it is wrong, and of course I do realize how far-fetched this sounds. But you know what? This was the story of the four minute mile, I believe, which was once thought impossible to do by a human being. And then it took only one person to do it, for then everybody else to realize, oh wait, I can do that too, maybe. Inevitably, I believe that we come from a creator source, which, which I refer to as God, which is in many ways synonymous with nature, in my view of God, where we see that one of the aspects of God is randomness. We brought order from chaos variety. In a sense, I would say that it's good that there is more awareness about all these issues so that we can begin to talk more about it and see where that leads us. On another level, maybe perhaps the most important attribute of God or nature is unity. We, we know this because on the deepest level that we can measure with the technology that's available to us, everything is energy. Energy rearranging itself into different molecules and atoms and structures. And this energy is, of course, intelligent. And of course, with regard to homosexual and transsexual people, there are massive concerns from conservative parents who, of course, believe that their children are being indoctrinated to accept ideas that might otherwise not seem normal. And that, of course, is a legitimate fear and is a fear of the unknown because you, in a sense, you're going against a good chunk of what we know of biology, that it takes a male and a female to reproduce. But like I said, this unity that we share in that we're all one, essentially, which is, I believe, the ultimate truth, means that leaves the door open to the fact that there are a lot of possibilities, perhaps, for humans, which we may not have been able to conceive of based on how we view biology. And this isn't my attempt at mental masturbation. This is simply this is simply an open-mindedness and a and let's say a not fear of the unknown. As Jordan Peterson said in one of the interviews which I saw with uh, Sam Harris uh, about four years ago, this interview happened. I'm not sure exactly how he said it, but I'll try and get the gist of the argument here. Is that oftentimes there are many ways to proceed. And it's not obvious which is the right one. And many people will have many, many stupid ideas and they may, and they will go on to enact those ideas or bring them into fruition while the rest of society awaits to see whether or not that will bring any negative consequences. And most of those ideas generally turn out to be stupid and fail in the end. However, however, there is that one idea which, which although might seem stupid in the first place, might be absolutely essential or vital, I believe, was the word that he used vital in order to move forward and also another factor which would be remiss of me not to mention is the fact that the reality of where we are as a humanity right now is a consequence of the fact that is that we view biology and evolution through a very conservative and scientific lens an example of this is that we used to think that uh, some conditions were genetic and there's no way to avoid them and that let's say somebody has a genetic predisposition to get cancer because cancer is in the family then that 
that automatically means that you have the genetic predisposition to develop cancer at some point. Whereas it seems as if science is now arriving at a point where we are understanding that our genetics don't actually define who we are, but that we can actually change, alter our genetics. This is the science of epigenetics. Traditionally, we always like to err on the side of conservatism, like this is what we know, better the devil you know than anything else. But I think that's a very narrow view of our potential as a species. And that is slowly beginning to shift now with new think and, and of course quantum physics and epigenetics and all that. We're beginning now to understand that our beliefs as well as our environment can actually affect us genetically and cause genetic changes within us and cause changes within our genome, which essentially has the potential to at some point change our entire physiology even. And so that's why I wouldn't be so quick to dismiss anything that seems strange or new or not understandable, because the consequences of anything new are definitely unknown, but that's what we're here to find out. It doesn't mean that because we don't understand something that it's inherently bad or wrong, we, we definitely need to have an open mind. And this is coming from someone who was fully conservative around 10 years ago. And through experience and learning, I'm now more liberal than conservative. Right, that is it. I believe I should end the video here because it is becoming quite long already. And I think that I've covered the topics that I wanted to cover. I didn't really want to go that much into the Me Too movement. I think I've covered most of the basic points that I wanted to cover. Let me know in the comments if you'd like me to talk about any other specific issues that you might think. And then also, as always, let me know what are your thoughts on all of these issues that we discussed today on feminism, abortion and trans rights. I'd like to know if what I've said has maybe opened your mind to view things in a different way perhaps. I'd like to know if you disagree with me. Let me know in the comments, let's have a conversation. And finally, if you've made it this far, of course, don't forget to like the video, subscribe if you enjoyed the content and I'll be back really soon with another video. Take care for now.